is the following topics. I'll start with uh, a brief introduction about IR 4.0, the digital economy strategy, um, Sarawak. And then I'll talk a little bit about, I think the, the, the bigger focus for today's talk is how digital technology is affecting um, social transformation and also how it's impacting our society in general. I'll cover a little bit about education, about our future work, about data, AI, finance, and government. There's still a lot long list that I want to cover, but unfortunately, I don't think we have time to cover that within one hour uh, talk session. And if you have any question, please feel free to share in the chat box. Uh, Elliot and the rest of the team in TSI is monitoring the chat box for any question. So let me start with this. I think you probably uh, have heard this statement many, many times become a cliche, whereby our life is governed by technology. From the moment that we wake up until we sleep at night, uh, I would say majority of us, um, I'm, I'm willing to bet more than 90% of us who start our day with a smartphone in the hand and probably go to sleep at the end of the day with smartphone in the hand. Um, who are not doing that? You probably you can see something in the chat box. So our, our life is tightly interrelated with technology. Um, internet connectivity, um, the World Wide Web, uh, emails, social media has become part and parcel of our life, either for work purpose or for leisure and so on. It's very difficult to run away from any of this. Once in a while, of course, you feel tired about being connected to the social media, being tired to be connected to emails and so on, and you want to run away for Langkawi, uh, the current tourism bubble. But most of the time, you are dependent on technology. So that's our life, basically. So if, if you refer to, to Abraham Maslow, uh, one of the psychologists, I would say. And he presented one of the important theory, which is the hierarchy of needs. Uh, as human being, we have the needs from the bottom part, which, which is psychological or physiological, sorry about that, uh, which cover um, sleep, food, and so on. And as we go up above the pyramid, going up the pyramid, then our needs become different. And I guess for almost all human being, we want to reach self-actualization. And my, my personal experience, all this actually related to the age. I mean, when, when you finish your study at degree level, um, when I look at my students, they are very eager to go to the job market and get a job and get paid at the end of the month. But once you reach a certain age, um, money is of course important, you cannot deny that, but there are things in life that you crave for. Um, the feeling of being respected, being important. I think everybody, every individual have different needs. But ultimate goal is actually self-actualization. But that's not, point, not the point, actually. If you look on the right-hand side, the other new pyramid, uh, it is meant as a joke, actually. But apart from the food, the sleep, the money, the house, the safety, the family, and so on, everybody, everybody needs Wi-Fi and battery. Uh, we, we used to go to shops and fight over uh, who get access to the socket or the PowerPoint if you go to the airports. Uh, but most airports nowadays provide free lounge where you can charge your smartphone and you can have free uh, Wi-Fi. Once upon a time, these two items, Wi-Fi or internet connectivity and battery become uh, the item of importance. Another one to reflect our life is the number of hours or minutes that we spend through this medium. Um, I really suggest to all of you to do um, what we call as a time lock diary to see how much time that you spend, especially on internet and social media. You might guess a number, but multiply that by three to get the actual number that you spend. So this one is 2020, they come up with this uh, every year, and this is 60 seconds. Eh? So please bear in mind that the number that you are looking at is 60 seconds. One minute of your day is spent uh, on this. Um, what it means that in 60 seconds, this is the amount of data that goes through different platforms. Let's take one example, Facebook, 1.3 million logging in uh, out of 500 million users, if I'm not mistaken. WhatsApp, 20 million text sent. So by the time I finish talking about this slide, 
Uh, this is the amount of images or text or video that is uh, crossing around the internet. And it is staggering actually. If you look at the, the number of hours that we spend and back to the first slide that I mentioned just now, it is tightly related to our life. Um, it's correlated to our work and it is correlated to our personal life. So let's move to 4.0, IR 4.0. That's the buzzword uh, everywhere that you go and you read, whether it's RMK12, whether it's the Sarawak Digital Economy Strategy, you will hear this term, uh, IR 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution. Two different things. Uh, fourth industrial revolution is the era. Uh, IR 4.0 is a specific set of pillars of technology which govern the industrial revolution. So this man, Prof. Klaus Schwab, uh, he's actually the founder and executive chairman for the World Economic Forum back in 2016. He came up with this book in one of the retreats in Geneva. Uh, I think every year the WF has their, their retreat in Switzerland, Geneva. And back in 2016, he came up with this fourth industrial revolution. Uh, the timeline for the actual fourth industrial revolution start back 2011 or 2012, um, they, they trace back to Germany as one of the country that started the fourth industrial revolution. And his statement mentioned that the fourth industrial revolution will affect the very essence of our human experience. The videos that you saw just now um, touch on some of the pillars within the fourth IR or the IR 4.0. I'll touch a little bit on that. Let's look at the timeline actually. We, we cannot talk about the fourth industrial revolution without talking about the first, the second, and the third. And I'll pick up a few important trends across all these industrial revolution. Around 1784, the 18th century, that is the first industrial revolution. Now, three trends that you should pay attention to. All the industrial revolution is fueled by capitalism. It's all about making money. It's not about making the society better. It's not making human civilization better and so on. But the, the driver behind industrial revolution is profitability and capitalism, as simple as that. So in the first industrial revolution, the key technology, technological breakthrough is steam engine. One of a good example uh, of the industry affected by the first industrial revolution is the cotton industry in UK. So cotton industry, from uh, the plantation to the factory or the mill uh, is done mainly by human labor. So humans have to go to the field, um, get the crop, um, and then send it to the uh, factory to be pre-processed and then turn into loom and so on. So it's heavily dependent on human. So human have lawns, they can fall sick, they can uh, cheat during work, uh, and so on, which is the same until now. So people have been thinking how to reduce dependency on human labor and increase productivity at the same time. Increased product productivity is translated into higher profit profitability. So the solution is the, the first um, technological breakthrough, which is the steam engine. So they invented machine that can do the processing, the um, spinning of the cotton and so on. And the, the, the machine is called mechanical loom. So that changes a lot of things actually. Reduce dependency on human labor, increase productivity, increase profitability. That's great. The second thing that we should notice, and I will touch a bit about this in one of the slide, is about job loss and job creation. For each of the industrial revolution, you will see job loss. So humans are out of work uh, from the factory and so on. But at the same time, new job will be created. And usually this new job require higher skill. So you need people to uh, service the machine. You need people to operate the machine and so on. So three things that we should pay attention for each of the industrial revolution. First is the technological breakthrough. Second is the job loss and a job creation, and second, a third, uh, what what is affected actually? Which which industry and which area in the economic sector are affected? Now, if you go to the second industrial revolution, and now the center is in US, uh, the technological breakthrough is electricity, and two 
important example is uh, pipelining. We call it pipelining at the factory. Uh, one is the automotive industry, Ford, and the other one is slaughterhouse, just to give you two examples. So what happened with a pipeline assembly system? At every point, there is specific tasks being uh, done by specific people that require a specific skill. So if you look at automotive industry, the assembly line, maybe the, the first point is working on the frame of the car. And then you can go to the second point where you install the engine. And then the third one, you put in the tires and so on. So at every specific point, there is specific dedicated people with specific skill. Again, the driver for this, increase productivity, reduce dependency on human labor, increase automation, and at the end of the day, increase profitability. Pay attention to the timeline from the first industrial revolution to the second industrial revolution is around 100 years different. And then if you move to the third industrial revolution, which is in 1969, 1970s, uh, the technological breakthrough is uh, logic controller and PC, personal computers. So those are the two technological revolution. The difference in timeline between uh, 1870s and 1969, again, is around 100 years. So job loss, new job created, and main drivers is again profitability and increase. Um, productivity. Now, if we jump to the fourth industrial vision, uh, what is the difference actually, or what are the differences? So, in terms of technological breakthrough, the keyword used in a lot of literature is what we call as cyber physical. I'll explain that later. Um, the main driver is still productivity and profitability, uh, job losses and job created. But the problem between the first and the second, the second and the third, and the third to the fourth is actually the timeline. So between the first, the second, and the third, the time difference is approximately 100 years. There is time to stabilize the job market. Yes, job loss, correct. But you have time to, to cater for the job loss by reskilling and retraining people, upskilling, and so on. But if you notice the timeline between the third and the fourth, so 1970s and 2011, if you if you take the, the, the timeline for the fourth industrial revolution, so it's basically around 40 years. And the next one, the fifth, and people are talking about the fifth industrial revolution will be faster than that. So the time needed to adjust become shorter and that will affect the job market. So what's the difference between the third and the fourth? The key is intelligence. You have actuators in the third industrial revolution, which is moving part, robots. You have sensor in the third industrial revolution, um, various type of sensor, distance, infrared, sound, and so on. But the difference and the key difference is intelligence. So in order for a system to be smart and intelligent, you need data. So this is where big data comes in, in internet of things comes in to collect the data being processed by a system to come up with a decision or planning. So those are the two key things where you want to make decision and you want to plan for something. So at the end of the day, the fourth industrial revolution, whereby the dying pillars come in, uh, is actually to make a system more intelligent. So what are the nine pillars? You always hear some of them, big data analytics, BDA, um, that's, that term is going around. Autonomous Autonomous robot, that is very interesting. Uh, autonomous car, autonomous factory, autonomous whatever it is. Uh, simulation, probably not relevant to many people, but what it is, if you have dangerous situation, let's say um, war. So before you send soldier to the war, um, you, you cannot simulate real war. So the best that you can do is to simulate as, as close as possible. Or when you have something so complex, like a factory, before you build a factory, which costs a lot of money, you want to know how it works, what are required, and so on, you can build a simulation. So that is what that is what we call a digital twin. System integration is another pillar, but again, more probably affect uh, a specific, specific set of people, whereby you integrate all these pillars into um, a platform, usually at the factory. IoT is again another term that you will hear a lot. And now it start to come to our home. So how many of you have um, 
all these smart light, uh, smart vacuum, smart almost everything. So here now you 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 will hear advertisement about electrical goods like Daikin, intelligent air conditioner, whereby you can switch on by the time you arrive home, your house will be nice and cool. Um, the light can be switched on and switched off automatically while using your smartphone. Um, it has been there in the market for the past 10 years, but now we reach the point where the price is actually affordable and it is easy to use. But there is danger when you have IoT, then it is susceptible to um, botnet attack, virus attack, and so on. So that is where cybersecurity comes in, not just for IoT, but for the whole spectrum of technology. Now, cloud computing is something that you will definitely use. The moment you say that you are using Facebook, the moment that you, you say that you're using any of the Google services, Gmail, G Drive, Google Calendar, uh, name it, uh, TikTok, what else? Uh, IG, WhatsApp, those are running on the cloud. So what is cloud? You don't care the location of the server. You don't care the location of the services. You don't care the location of your data. It is somewhere there, up there in the cloud. As long as you can use it, you don't care about it. But it is a combination of many, 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 many technology system from security, from the infrastructure, from the software, the protocols, and so on. Additive manufacturing may be not a term that you are familiar with, but if I mention 3D printing, then probably you have heard about it. So additive manufacturing is probably the official term for 3D printing. So 3D printing, again, it is something that is becoming um, a regular item, similar to the inject printer and laser jet printer that you have 10 years ago or 15 years ago, not many people have that. But now we are looking at the same trend for 3D printing. You can get 3D printer as low as 700 ringgit if you go to Cytron. I'm not trying to promote, promote any website, but uh, usually in Malaysia, we go to Cytron, one of the online provider for um, electronics and so on. Uh, that one you have to assemble yourself, unfortunately. But the price point will go lower in years to come, very soon actually. But what are the use cases? That's, that's a lot actually. Um, and it's not limited only to the PLA or ABS material, which is plastic based material. People are printing human organs, people are printing food, people are printing houses, big structure, people are printing a lot of things actually. So don't be surprised the things that you purchase or the things that you are living in, in, in near future will be created by 3D printers. Augmented reality, this one, AR and VR, uh, again, something that probably you have heard and some of you probably have experienced that through gaming and so on. Uh, in Sarawak or in Kuching, we are fortunate. Um, Sebo Dynamic, one of the company has set up a VR lab. I think that's the term that they use in Kota Samarahan. But unfortunately, due, due to COVID, I think they are not operation at the moment. But we are very lucky. Um, if you are Sarawakian and when the situation has improved, uh, feel free to visit uh, Server Dynamic Virtual Lab in Kota Samarahan. So we have to touch a little bit about digital economy. Uh, two things, the Malaysian digital economy, which was launched 2018, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I think this week and last week, um, if you hear the presentation for RMK12, uh, there is a program called Jendela, and of course, our own Sarawak Digital Economy Strategy. If you ask my personal opinion, it's a brilliant action by the state government. Um, if you compare to the rest of Malaysia, the other state, I think Sarawak is probably one of the first state that embark on a digital economy strategy, even faster than the federal government. Why? Because if you look at the vision of the state, um, whereby to reach the high income state in 2030, we cannot rely on our natural resources. We cannot rely on oil and gas because those are not renewable. Um, maybe by 2050, we'll be uh, exhausting our oil and gas reserve. Uh, gas probably still a lot, but oil is drilling down. 
we cannot rely on commodity like palm oil or rubber or paper because it goes up and down, susceptible to diseases, uh, weather and so on. We cannot rely probably too much on manufacturing because what happened to Malaysia back in the 80s and 90s when the labor cost was low compared to other countries, we were the center of manufacturing. But then people moved to China. But now people move out of China and going to South Africa or the African continent. So it will follow the labor force. If um, for some reason the um, economic well-being of a country increases and then the cost of labor increases, then business will move somewhere else, as simple as that. So the good thing is if we compare ourselves to probably our neighbor Singapore, um, which doesn't have any natural resources, we have a lot of natural resources, but we need something to drive our economy to the next level. So choosing digital economy is a brilliant strategy, I would say, but it is not without challenges. Now, a lot of people complain about um, the lack of infrastructure, the lack of a lot of things. Eh? Um, if, if you are in that area, um, dealing with infrastructure and so on, it takes time. You cannot simply solve that by throwing a lot of money and expecting that to be solved within one or two years time. Estonia, for example, took 15 years to reach where they are now. So they started probably 15 or more than that, uh, their digital economy strategy. So in a way, we are very lucky because our leaders are visionaries, but of course, certain things probably can be improved and we can work together to do that. Now let's look at COVID. Um, when we talk about IR 4.0, and the technology pillars. Most people understand about that. And when you talk to businesses, when you talk to factory owners, they understand the benefits and the advantages if they actually embark on the fourth industrial revolution or IR 4.0. But what stops them is actually the capital investment. When you go towards technology, you have to invest. You have to invest on the infrastructure, you have to invest on the missionary, you have to invest on the human capital, retrain them, upskill and so on. And the return of investment is probably three to five years down the road. So it's very difficult to change or swap between the comparatively cheaper uh, labor force and swap that with technology. But COVID-19, uh, apart from the hassle it brings and the, the devastation, I think that's the right term to use, uh, after almost two years going through COVID-19 pandemic and affect a lot of people, families and so on. From the technology point of view, it become the fuel that drives technology because people do not have a choice when it comes to Education, you cannot stop education. We have to swap or switch to online learning. When it comes to working, you cannot totally stop everybody from working. What we can do is to work from home. Um, for businesses and factories and so on, if they have invested on automation, then this is probably where they get the return of investment, whereby their factory floor or their assembly line can run despite undergoing the MCO and so on. If you go through the financial statement, um, I think the government did mention during the MCO, one day is 35 billion losses or 3.5 billion. I think it's 35 billion if I'm not mistaken. Sorry for not confirming that. But it's a huge number. It's a huge number in terms of the economic loss because of the closure of the economic sectors during the MCO period. So due to COVID, it became a necessity. It's not a choice anymore. It became a necessity. Now let's look at the impact. Edit, remind me on the time, okay? I think I have 30 minutes time. Now this is very important. When I, when I look at the objective of Yes, I talk, and what attracts me is about future leaders. Those youth out there, uh, like Elliot, Sharon, and so on, I just met them just now. These are the bright people that will shape the future of our state and our nation. And I want to focus on digital technology. Now, when you talk about technology, any type of technology, um, nuclear power, nuclear fission, you name it, mechanization, 
every type of technology comes with both the good and the bad, as simple as that. So what is important, you need to know, you as, as in the, the, the future leaders, eh? that technology can help to improve our life, the people's life to make it fairer, more peaceful and more just. But at the same time, it can also threaten privacy, erode security and fuel inequality. So some of these I will touch when I talk about those topics after this. So we have a responsibility and especially our future leaders, the youth of today, you have a choice. So the keyword there is choice. So when people make atomic bomb, it's not that they are being forced or maybe the scientists were forced at gun, gun point to come up with the nuclear bomb. But we have a choice actually. Uh, AI, for example, uh, what else? Um, a lot of things whereby we have a choice, whether we want to proceed with that or we want to consider what is probably better in the future. So just to illustrate some of the things that is happening in our society, I, 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 I don't talk specifically about society. To me, this is one aspect about technology that is probably a bit disturbing, but we are, we are all going through this. Eh? Uh, the family institution, um, learning, our day-to-day -to -day life, our lifestyle is in a way affected by technology. How many of us, and I'm, I'm trying to reflect myself as well, when we go out, probably it is, it is a distant memory, eh? when we go out together as a family or in a group of people and colleagues and sit down at the table to have lunch, dinner, and so on, that we actually talk to one another. Uh, it, it is, in a way, mind-boggling that we prefer to text someone probably a few hundred miles away, but we fail to probably communicate to the person in front of us or next to us. And as I said, uh, it happens to me as well. So as much as possible, I, I, I want, uh, I try to ban mobile phone at dinner table or maybe go out for dinner or lunch and so on, which is a very challenging thing. And I'm sure some of you probably experienced that as well. So is there a solution to this? Uh, I don't think so. I think this is probably something that each individual, each family, each person in the community have to decide what is best for them and their families. Eh? And it is affecting our children as well. Now, just to sidetrack a little bit, um, do you believe that our children are addicted? Or not our children, I think we are addicted to technology, mobile phones, social media. But there is the difference actually. Now, if you look at the term addiction, addiction is caused by a chemical called dopamine. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if some of you are actually expert on this. So dopamine in our brain, when you do something that is pleasurable, dopamine is being injected in our brain. We feel happy, we feel good. But the problem with dopamine, you need to reinforce that. And over time, you need to double the level, triple. You need to get a stronger dose of dopamine to feel the same way. So that's why with substance of addiction, um, alcohol, tobacco, drugs, they have age limit. So age limit for certain item like tobacco, 18 if I'm not mistaken, because I don't smoke. Uh, alcohol, 21 or 18 in Malaysia and so on. So why there is an age limit? Because after certain age limit, that individual probably can have self-control on the substance of abuse. But if using smartphone um, show similar traits as addiction, why would we allow our young children as young as two years old to use a smartphone without limit? Not to say that smartphone is bad, but letting the keyword here without limit until to the point of addiction. So would we happy to give our children two years old a cigarette, but at the same time, we give them smartphone, okay? open to discussion. Now, the first thing that I want to probably share is uh, on social transformation. I'm happy to share the work from my colleague, Prof Nara, uh, 
and the pioneers at the Institute of Social Informatic and Techn Technological Innovation, ECT, UDIMANS, uh, with the work that they have done to connect the diverse and dispersed community, especially in Sarawak. Uh, the center was known as KORI back in 1999, was led by Prof. Hairuddin. Um, those are the founders, Prof. Hairuddin, Prof. Roger Harris, uh, Prof. Elvin, uh, Dr. Pauline, and so on. And one of the key project is for is e barrio um, so th thank you to the people of barrio especially john uh, and the rest of the committee in barrio and uh, i joined that team back in 2001 so i still remember going to barrio um, and saw with my own eyes how they bring the computer to the telecenter using the buffalo cut so compact presario four megabyte of RAM, if I'm not mistaken, 20 unit of them was put at the back of a bullock cart and was pulled through muddy track. There was no tar road during that time back in Barrio. So apart from Barrio, there are several other telecenter projects uh, throughout Sarawak. And uh, the recent one is actually in uh, Orang Asi settlement in Pahang and um, Kelantan there under the Tipoa project. So this is one example of how technology can bridge the digital divide and positively impact the social transformation of a community. The main idea is actually to connect the people in the rural area through, um, at that time was VSET, for the purpose of communication and to bring knowledge uh, from the outside to Barrio. But our personal experience, and this is probably what I want to conclude at the end of the slide, um, not this slide, at the end of the talk, uh, even though my area is on technology, and when we talk about IR 4.0 and fourth industrial vision and the nine pillars of IR 4.0, it's all about technology, but at the end of the day, it's all about the people. We, we don't go to the community, throw them 20 computers and just leave. That wouldn't work. Uh, that will have a negative impact. And that is not the most important. Um, so that's, that's the key thing, actually. So there are various initiatives actually, and under the state government, uh, there are a lot of initiatives as well, under SMA, under SDAC, under the uh, Pustaka Negeri Sarawak. There are various initiatives to connect the rural community to the rest of the world, and some of them from the federal government through SKMM or MCMC, uh, Pusat Internet. Uh, they are close to 800 plus Pusat Internet throughout Malaysia, and Sarawak has one of the highest, 114 if I'm not mistaken, to start internet, this uh, Bistari net uh, for schools, uh, still running if I'm not mistaken. Ibarrio is one of the key example. Uh, it was established back in 2000. Let's move to education. I'm sure all of you experienced this. During COVID, we have to switch to online learning. And what do you think? Challenging? Yep, for a lot of people, for the parents, for the teachers, for many, many parties. Because in order for you to participate in online learning, in order for you to participate in work from home, you need infrastructure, which is connectivity. You need equipment, either smartphone or tablet or laptop or PC. If you have six children uh, and you come from B40 family, it doesn't make sense to have six different devices to, to connect at the same time. Um, you need suitable content because the content that you use for face-to-face -face is not suitable and you need to train the instructor, the teachers and so on. So in a way, again, you, you have to give credit to the government. Um, when this happened, they, they have something on paper, but to actually execute that is another story. But it works to a certain extent. Uh, we, we still get students to, to, to get knowledge. Uh, of course, around 30% of the student either at school or tertiary level do not have access and they are affected. But we have read and heard story about teachers going beyond their normal duty to, to go to, to the children, um, to, to provide them with the content, to assist them and so on. And I, I salute uh, the educators, the teachers, and probably some of you here for the work that you have done. Some institutions go high tech. This one is Harvard Business School. They have the money, so it shouldn't be a problem for them. So what they are trying to do to emulate as much as possible the environment where you will experience during face-to-face -face learning. Um, you can see the curved wall where you have the face of all the participants. The instructor is in the center. 
and he or she can watch all the faces and so on. Uh, my personal experience, um, I've been conducting online learning for the past four semesters, actually. I think it's our culture. So usually during my class, no, none of the students will switch on the webcam. And I, I don't enforce. Uh, but you, you, you don't get the same feeling. Teaching in a face-to-face -face where you can see their emotion, their eyes, their smile, and their sleeping and things like that. It's part and parcel of the environment. So you lose that context through the online environment. Moving on. Um, this is interesting. I'll touch a little bit on this. If you read this book from Don Tapscott, he came to Sarawak for IDEX, the conference on digital coming back in 2018. And what is interesting, two things. He wrote this book back in 1995. So what is 1995? Internet was launched, not the internet, the World Wide Web was launched by uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee in CERN, Switzerland, 1994. So a year after the World Wide Web was launched, he came up with this book mainly about digital economy. But one of the trends that he talked about in his book is about the disappearance of university. And he quote Peter Drucker. So Peter Drucker back in 1998 mentioned that in 30 years, most of the university will be wiped out of existence. Why? Because of the internet. To some extent, it's true. When MIT released their lecture note for free to the public and people start wondering, oh, what's the point of having universities actually? Nowadays, you can get content about anything. You go to YouTube, even TikTok nowadays. I mean, anything under the sky that you want to learn, you can go to YouTube, you can get lecture notes, you can get videos, you can get tutorial from some of the very well-known figures in their own areas. For computer science, for example, you get Andrew Ng for machine learning, deep learning, and, and many, many people. And that's the beauty of internet. Rather than duplicating the work to create the same content, we should share the content. So that is where open courseware comes in, MOOC, massive open uh, online courses comes in and so on. But why we still have university? And then during the pandemic, we can see that session can still go on with online learning and so on for tertiary level. Uh, but why we still need university? Two things that probably online learning cannot duplicate. One is the experience. If you still remember your school days or your university days, eh, apart from going to the lectures, tutorials, and lab, I think part and parcel of university life and the school life is about the interaction, the food that you eat, the people that you meet, the heartbroken experience that you go through, and so on. So basically, university is four years where you get old and experience all this. Can you experience that online? To a certain extent, probably yes, but it's not the same. And the second one is university certify your achievement. Anybody can go to YouTube. They can claim that they learned something, but that is a self-claim. Nobody certify you for that. So university can put a stamp on a piece of paper, the scroll that you get at the end of your study to say that you have achieved something. And since people trust university, then a piece of paper that you get is of value. Will that change? To a certain extent, yes. Some company like Google, Facebook, they don't use your CV, your degree to, to get you to, 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 to work for them. What they do is to conduct interview. You can apply whether you have a certificate, a degree or not. As long as you can get through their interview, then they know that you can actually fulfill the job. As simple as that. So you can self-learn, self-taught, and you don't need to go to university and so on. But it's not for everybody. We, we have online um, distance learning for quite some time. And when I mentioned about MOOC, uh, there was a craze, I think, three to four years back. A lot of people joined these MOOC courses. At, at the time, you have millions and millions of people. But the pass-through rate, whereby the people that actually complete everything is less than 5%. So what it means, this online learning is probably suitable for those that have self-discipline. But most of us and the people that go to university at that age probably lack self-discipline. I'm not saying that you don't have self-discipline, the, the, the youth, eh? but that, that's, I think, the reality. Online learning is good for those that have self-control and self-discipline, but not for everybody. A lot of research is being done. Some of the result is out. Uh, go to this uh, this this um, URL. 
uh, to see what are the impact of online learning to schools and to tertiary level and so on. And of course, it's, it's not good. It's not good. So you, you at this point of time, you cannot replace face-to-face -face learning with online learning. There are several disadvantages. Now let's move on to future of work. I have another 10 minutes, so I have to really go through quite fast. What is important that I want to highlight and related to the industrial vision is job loss and job created. If you read this report from the World Economic Forum and the list of jobs that will be lost in the few years time, very, very soon, and some of the, the, the job in this list is very surprising. Fast food cook at 81%. Telemarketer, of course, makes sense. Loan officer, yes. I don't think you have to see loan officer to apply for a loan. You just go to the uh, online website, fill in the form, and they can actually tell you whether you are eligible for loan and so on. Cashier and so on. So this is the threat. Um, IR 4.0 is great, but what should we do about job loss and job creation? Again, the state of Sarawak, uh, if you go to Centex, if you go to Skill Sarawak uh, website, they are doing a lot of things. Uh, Centex, for example, is providing six-month training with allowances to uh, graduates and the youth with uh, guaranteed job at the end of the training and so on. But what is worrying, and if you look at this report and the key findings, the pace is actually very fast. As I mentioned just now, between the first and the second hundred years, second and the third is hundred years. The third and uh, the second and the third is forty years. Uh, sorry, the, I'm getting confused. The third and the fourth is forty years. It is getting faster, so the buffer for the job creation and job loss is getting shorter. So something needs to be done or currently be done, and it has to be, uh, in a way, fast forward using various initiatives. So I'll, I'll pick a few which I think is very important. So the job loss is not only for the blue collar worker, but also affecting the white collar as well. So the M40 and T20 at the same time. Uh, so don't be surprised. Even as a lecturer, people claim job with creative element is very hard to be replaced by automation or robot, but not necessarily so. Um, so every one of us is in threat. Now, what I want to pick out is inequality is likely to be exhibited because if you look at an example, let me move to the next screen, which is happening around us. If you go to McDonald, this is what you see nowadays. Have you wondered where are the people that man the cashier last time work now? So there used to be three to four cashier at McDonald. But now they, you only have one cashier, even that is not man all the time, and being replaced by this machine. Toll both in Semenanjung has been replaced by fully automated system. Uh, if you go to Imat Tab 1, they have self-checkout counter. What's going to happen to the people who work there at the cashier? Uh, this one probably in Semenanjung, the public transport mainly moved to the self-ticketing machine. And a lot more, actually. If you go to the shopping mall, now we have the uh, pay and go using the smartphone. So what happened to the attendance? Yes, you have maybe one attendance, but compared to last time. And there are a lot of other examples that I can give. So the, the point is, what happened to those people? Yes, you can upskill and reskill them. But the trend is you need higher skill level. It's very difficult to move them to the horizontal level, move from one blue collar job to another blue collar job. But what you can do now is to upskill them vertically up to the next level. So who's going to service this machine? Who's going to write the code for this machine? Who's going to whatever has to do with this machine? So we have to train them. Of course, there are initiatives to do that, but how fast that we can actually prepare them for this and how we can predict which else or what else will be affected by job losses due to technology. So why robot? So don't, don't get confused. Eh? When we mention autonomous or automation, it's not just physical robot, but it's actually software. So the bulk of automation nowadays is driven by software, line of codes. So this robot is just a physical representation of the software. So these are the benefits. They don't sleep, they don't get sick, they don't cheat, they are loyal to you, they don't jump from 
one company to another company. The problem is high cost of investment. Let me play this video. Don't need to see the sound. I'll skip a few things. So Amazon, this is from three years ago. So what happened is this is the warehouse of Amazon. Uh, now it's close to 97% automation. This robot, they have sensor in front and their job is to go under the rack and they bring the rack to a specific location. So if you order something from Amazon, this robot will go directly to the rack that has your items and bring them to a human sorter. So that's the only part left because robot is not dexterous enough to get things from the rack and to your basket and so on. So they work 24-7. Uh, every charge can last for 48 hours, two days. They actually work in dark. So when they take this picture, they have to switch it on for the purpose of video capture, but they actually work in dark. Um, no accident, never apply for leave, no need for MCO and so on. Let me fast forward to where we have the human. So this is the part where you have human, around 3% left because to get things from the boxes, uh, the robot hand is not as good as human. But they predict this will be replaced in the next five years. So what is the problem with this? Each of the robot costs 3 million US dollars. 3 million US dollar per robot, the orange robot just now. And Amazon predict the return of investment is three to five years old. So for, for Malaysian company and factory owners, uh, there's a lot of investment. And our labor is still cheaper compared to technology investment. But again, COVID, it is something that we change. And if it continues, then it will change the landscape of businesses. Why? Because if you are given a choice between uh, stopping your factory from operating and investing into the robot, then of course you will choose the robot because it will keep your factory going. Another example, fast food industry, not in Malaysia yet. So robot cook this hamburger using image processing to know uh, the state of the meat, whether it's still raw, cooked. So the claim is perfect burger, not undercooked, not overcooked, never burned. Um, just, just to give a local context, uh, do you care if your laksa prepared by a robot at the back there and it comes out as good as mom laksa or haji saleh mi sapi or mi kolo and so on? I, I don't think you would care as long as it tastes as good or even better. It is probably more hygienic, faster and so on. But what happened to the people that works there? Um, give me another 10 minutes, uh, Elliot. <sighs> Emergency time, eh? 10 minutes. I'm at half point actually, so I'll, I'll skip this. So work from home, we experienced that. And what is interesting, this came out uh, last week. Uh, people always wonder whether it's good or not. Personally, I feel great working at home. I've been working at home since, what, six months ago, seven months ago. Forget how to drive to Yidimas. Um, But some people probably don't drive at home because of various reasons. But this is actually a research done by Microsoft on their workers in the US. Excuse me. And they, they, one, one of the key findings is bad for productivity. So what they found out when you work from home, which is probably a bit surprising, they, they communicate less, which is surprising, because I thought that when you work at home, you're connected online, you will communicate more, but it seems they are more siloed. That's, that's the term they, they use. And the connection between the silo, within the silo getting stronger, but outside the silo is getting weaker. So it shows that it's not good. Because in order to increase productivity, you have to collaborate and network as many as possible, as frequent as possible. So read this article, very interesting, the latest finding from Microsoft and other big company also see the same trend, lower productivity. Um, and this is probably the two things related to work from home. Now, read this report from McKinsey. Again, very interesting. I pick up two points. We always think, Work from home is suitable for a certain job. Uh, maybe for lecturer like me, easy for me to work at home, or maybe for a certain job. But what they found out, the work from home suitability is determined by tasks and activities, not occupation. So for each of us, we are doing certain tasks and activities. So certain activities is preferable online at home, but some activities is actually should be done in office context. So that one is actually very surprising. And another thing that we probably didn't notice, um, working from home, 
does affect the local economies. Similar with online learning and education. I'll take a very simple example. If you go to Kota Samarahan, Kota Samarahan thrived because the existence of the student and the university, UITM, UNIMAS, uh, and some other institution. With the absence of student, a lot of uh, businesses in the Kota Samarahan area has to be closed down. Um, rental has gone down and there's a lot of vacancy in terms of house and rooms and so on. And if you go to the summer shopping complex, that is almost dead actually, because the, the frequent pattern for summer shopping complex are the students or were the students. So that's bad how it is. And they are doing a lot of research about certain city which is dependent on workers. Uh, I would suspect in Malaysia is probably KLCC, the, the Golden Triangle. Uh, in Kuching, probably certain area, maybe Icom Square or the city center. But, but those are related to the local economies. Uh, future of data, big data, you heard about it. Um, people are using our data. So when you use Facebook and Google, it's not free. You are trading your, the, their service with your data. I like to watch movie, and this is one of those that I watched recently through Netflix. Um, the title is The Circle. Uh, please watch it. Watch this if you have access to Netflix. But I, I don't watch for the sake of the, the, the plot. I'm interested on the underlying technology in this movie, actually. So if you watch The Circle, it looks or sound and feel very similar to Facebook whereby a company is monitoring whatever that you're doing, collecting your personal data and profile, which they claim for your own personal good. So what they claim is knowing is good, but knowing every better, uh, knowing everything is better. So if, if, if you want to live in an environment, uh, utopian society where the bad guy is caught and you feel safe. So this company claim that you should disclose everything. So very interesting movie. Um, from the context of technology, the plot itself sucks. Rotten Tomato gives them four out of ten. So don't expect good movie, but look at the technology behind this. So Tom Hanks probably they portray, portray as Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, go to this website. This is interesting. Uh, this is actually the list of our politicians, the MPs, and their uh, stats. Uh, this is done by an NGO that monitor and track the politician, I guess, as a check and balance. So apart from this interesting pixel art of the politician, and it is actually very interesting. So you can see all this icon which represents certain things. Eh? So go to the US website. What I can do, I'll put a link to my slide in the chat box after this, and you can have a link to this later, and please go visit all these article and website. Now, the last thing that probably I want to touch is a bit on AI. Uh, artificial intelligence. So it, it's going to change everything. Uh, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Kai Fuli from China, he's one of the experts uh, on AI. Uh, what is AI? The introduction video just now did mention a little bit about that. Uh, I skip on this. Uh, but how can it be dangerous actually? So if these people, Elon Musk, the late Stephen Hawking, and Bill Gates actually are very scared about AI, then I think there is a basis for that. Now, AI, if you watch too much movie like I do, like this, uh, usually they are portrayed as something that become um, malevolent, become very bad, and they try to kill human beings. Uh, probably they have basis to do that because we destroy our own environment and so on. But the, the point is, who created AI? Uh, we human create AI. And what we are scared, and this going to happen, is not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when. If you ask me when, I don't have an answer. If you ask the expert, they say probably 2030, 2050, probably some of you will still be around. And if you go to this link, this is very recent, UN actually called for a ban for AI technology that threat to human rights. So this is big news when UN actually mentioned this. Um, Another movie which I watched recently, uh, Free Guy. Again, the movie plot is not nice. Ryan Reynolds, you, you cannot go wrong with Ryan Reynolds, uh, Deadpool and so on. But look at the underlying technology whereby Ryan Reynolds or Guy in this movie play as an NPC, non-playable character in a game called Free City. 
So NPC, they are coded to do certain thing. Day in, day out, they are coded to do certain thing. They don't have free will. That's the keyword. But for some reason, this NPC develop their own algorithm whereby they divert from their own day-to-day -day coding and they can choose what they want to do. That's one. At the end of the movie, what is interesting, all the uh, character NPC in, in this uh, game uh, manage to go to another location online. They live happily ever after and the AI are all good. But that doesn't make sense. If an AI, sorry, if a code, which is a normal code, can evolve to become a, a good AI with free will, what stopped the original code from evolving, becoming a bad AI? What is bad AI? They can make decision on their own based on the parameters that they sense and so on. Um, I, I don't have time to explain in detail. Please contact me if you want to listen to three to four hours talk about AI. And last one, hopefully, extra time, huh, Elliot? Five minutes, five minutes. The future of finance. Again, the introduction video about blockchain, about fintech and so on, those are the things that you're going to see very, very soon or you probably have currently experiencing. What's the problem? The problem with our financial system, it is based on a centralized concept. The Federal Reserve Bank, our government is controlling the money. So we are using the fiat money system. So the government can print as much money as they want, but the money doesn't have any intrinsic value. So when you have 10 ringgit, what is that 10 ringgit based on? Nothing. It's based on the trust on the government that they say it is 10 ringgit. So that gives rise to the financial crisis back in 2008, the subprime mortgage crisis in US, which is cascaded throughout the world. And because of that, uh, a person by the name Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, again, that's another story, which is not known who he or she is up until now, eh? come up with the idea of decentralized ledger technology, DLT, which is known as blockchain. And probably you don't notice that, but it's actually associated with Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is the reward that you get when you actually approve a block in the blockchain. Again, another three hours of talk for that if you are interested. So you will hear this term, blockchain. You will hear this term cryptocurrency. You will hear this term fintech. You will hear this term DeFi. That is probably alien to you. What is DeFi? Decentralized finance. What's the difference between DeFi and fintech? Fintech, although it's using technology as the basis of the solution, but it is still based on centralized system governed by the banks. Now, if you are in the banking um, job at the moment, I think you should feel very, very scared. And the bank are very scared because they cannot stop this from happening. They cannot stop from decentralizing the banking system. Have you sent money overseas to anybody, your family or relative using Telegram or Western Union or remittance service? It is crazy. First, they charge you 25 ringgit per 1,000 ringgit. And then it takes five days for your money to get through, even though the money exists digitally. So they're actually in control of a lot of things. Read about this term, unbank. This is where a lot of people do not have access to banking service. 1.6 billion altogether in the world, eh, out of 8 billion population. In Sarawak and in Malaysia, we have people in the rural areas do not have access to banking services, finance services, and so on. So FinTech and DeFi will be the solution to that. Oops, sorry. Um, so where are we in terms of the unbanked? We are actually not too bad. We are around 7% of the population compared to our neighboring country. But there are still people in our country that still do not have access to banking system. And the last one, I guarantee this is the last one. How about the government? These are the keywords that you hear about any government in the world. The solution to this, again, is blockchain, whereby you can create transparency, as simple as that, transparency. Um, again, there is a link here, how you can use blockchain to ensure um, no corruption and tra transparency for government come from World Economic Forum and many, many government is trying to explore this. And the last one, again, I'm trying to confuse you. This is the term NFT, Google about it. You will find very interesting info about NFT, non-fungible token, non-NFT. So as the conclusion, I covered a lot on breath about a lot of things actually. I'm really sorry because I cannot go into the details, but hopefully the things that I shared probably can open up your mind and for you to explore this a bit later. I'll share the link to the slide after this. 
And please uh, feel free to explore about some of the topics that I mentioned just now. And with that, I would like to say thank you. Thank you.